Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. Um, I really enjoy extemping on different topics and going from thing to thing. And hopefully you'll tr like this experiment too. I'm calling this one Imho, that is in my humble opinion. <clears throat> my various thoughts on everything from diet to beauty to materialism to piano playing to um, saying hi to passersby to research to utilitarianism to stock investing to intergalactic research. So we'll cover a lot hopefully in around, I'm guessing, a half hour or something like that. Um, so there we go. Let's start with diet. Um, I was just listening to Lex Friedman's podcast, and he's a big devotee of the, the keto diet. And it's tempting because I have more energy, uh, my weight is better under control, uh, it's, uh, et cetera. I'm not as hungry. And I was asking myself, why am I resisting the keto diet? After all, lots of people still like it. It's a fad diet. It seems to have lasted for a while. And I guess the reason is, I think ultimately, because we so often medical research and other research changes its mind, it seems, every decade about what works and what doesn't. Cholesterol is bad for you. Cholesterol is good for you. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not what doesn't affect blood cholesterol, uh, you know, butter versus margarine, uh, you know, all that stuff. Anyway, it seems to me that I'd, in the absence of fairly definitive research or logic, I end up defaulting to common sense. And what strikes me as most common sense is moderation. Keeping your basic, your your weight and your heart rate and, and your consumption at a relatively stable level throughout the day and evening. And so the keto diet, they tend to eat one, two meals a day filled with fat and whatever. And somehow my gut is telling me, and I have no research to support this, that ultimately um, what has evolutionary enabled, evolutionarily enabled people to survive longest is a balance of carbohydrates and fruits and vegetables and, and meats and, uh, and the rest of it. And, you know, heaven forbid sugar. I could be totally wrong. But I do feel best about not intermittent fasting, again, where you're, you're not... You're not focusing on, you're, you're bringing up your calorie consumption in one huge fell and then you feel full and whatever, and then starving. I, I like the idea of stasis, not stressing the body unduly. But So I have lots of small meals a day that is a balance. I have some meat, not a lot. I have some carbs when I'm in the mood for them. I think my body tells me what I'm in the mood for. So sometimes it'll be, in the, I actually will be in the mood for a salad in which I put blue cheese and sun-dried tomatoes and regular tomatoes and uh, uh, which tastes good to me. Anyway, and sometimes I'm in the mood for a piece of meat, which I'll broil a piece of uh, top sirloin or chicken or something. Uh, and I like that balance. And I'll cheat. Sometimes I'll just eat whatever. I'll go nuts with the carbs. And I will eat. I had today, to be honest, I had a piece. Of, I went to my favorite little cafe after I did my, I do walk a, a vigorous 45-minute hilly the Lafayette Reservoir, and after that I rewarded myself and my doggy Hachi by sitting in this lovely French bakery called La Chatenia in Lafayette, California. A little plug, I really love it, I really do. And I get, at this time I was really bad. I carved out, I had um, a, a French butter croissant and a piece of quiche and a large coffee. I love coffee. Again, most of the data, by the way, shows that coffee in moderation is actually salubrious, it's actually good for you. Uh, and it also, some people, it makes them edgy. For me, it, it makes me feel good. It's like a mood elevator. I love it. Um, okay, enough about diet. Oh, I do want to say something else. One more thing. We tend to focus too obsessively on the nature of calories definitely count. Being fat can't be good. That I know. That puts a strain on your heart and everything else. So no, being within your normal body range. Now I'm not saying me skinny malink. Every body type is different. Not everybody's meant to be a skinny malink. Uh, but within your normal range, it makes sense. But beyond that, and getting compulsive about it, I think that people do that because they feel they over-exaggerate the power of diet to affect longevity and health. I'm not convinced that it's that potent. It's just that we can control that to some extent. Unfortunately, you know, at least half of who we are is genetic. And the other half is, yes, lifestyle. Nobody says so cigarette smoking is good or weed smoking, or drinking too much alcohol. 
And I also think with diet, I think just moderation, occasional cheats. I also think that's sustainable. And that avoids, again, the ups and downs that, again, doesn't provide stasis for the body. Anyway, that's my philosophy of diet. Now, careers, that's my main metier. That's what I do. I've been a career counselor for a long time. So I, I, I wanted to riff a little bit on what I think really are great careers. I want to talk about the range of things. There's different arguments that can be made. It'd be very easy for me to argue, for example, for optometrist. Because it's prestigious, you make six-figure income, you, you succeed with nearly every patient, there's no night and weekend calls. You know, it's, uh, it's a nice, clean co career. But an argument can be made for the life of poverty. I don't love to write, but I feel like it's my, it is the thing I do best, and it allows me a lot of control. I have control over what I write. And I can keep revising or not revising, be as perfectionistic or not perfectionist. I can choose my topic, word choice, all that. That's fun. So I think an argument can be made, given that you spend so many of your waking hours, your best hours, working. Why not? It seems like a reasonable trade-off to live in even relative poverty. Live with your parents. Live in a basement apartment with three roommates so that you can spend your work life writing. On the other end of the continuum, I, I do not look down upon people who go for the money who become investment bankers, who are big ticket uh, sales uh, items, corporate lawyers, uh, you know, uh, big C corporate CPAs. Because while it's easy for me to say, and I've said it a million times and I kind of believe it, that money can't buy happiness, and yet I see a lot of people get damn happy from living in a nice house, driving a nice car, getting new clothes all the time, decorating the way they like, putting a sunroom on their house. And even me, who's really quite Calvinist and ascetic in my in my and I in my self concept of what I believe matters, when my wife made me put a sunroom onto the house, it seemed superfluous, and yet I kind of love it. Is it worth the money? Not if I was tight, if I had very little, but I have enough. You know, um, I don't know. Um, I don't see ever why anybody would by a Jaguar or a BMW or a Mercedes that requires so much more maintenance and break down more often than a Toyota and cost three times as much really for the prestige. That I don't see. I don't see diamonds over cubic zirconium. I don't see $100 wine over $10 wine. People can't tell the difference. And if people do care about the snooty factor, screw them. That seems shallow to me. All right, enough about that. Clothing. As another example of where some people find great pleasure from clothing, it's a whole multi-billion dollar industry, whether it be clothing or there be more, you know, beauty like in makeup and stuff. I don't see it. I, I'm much more of the Mark Zuckerberg school who likes to just have a few outfits that it's really easy to take me five minutes to choose my clothes, two minutes to choose my clothes and get dressed and I'm done. But I wear what I like, things that I do like, like I happened to wanted to appear in a good mood. I was in a pretty good mood anyway, but I said, oh, I think I'll wear the yellow shirt. It'll make me seem a little less serious. Um, or I, you know, But I, I don't try to be fashion forward. I try to be timeless. Saves money, saves effort. I don't shop much. I do almost all my shopping on Amazon. Um, before, before the internet, that I would shop at Walmart uh, or Target. Um, Believe it or not, I know you laugh at me, but the quality is fine and their styles are fine. I'm not trying to be super fashion forward. For nostalgia, I wear, my father used to sell Lee jeans. I wear Lee jeans because they're all interchangeable and it's a f fairly priced, well-made product. And it reminds me of my dad, whom I love. Hard working guy, wonderful, wonderful ethical guy, I will say. It killed me that not only did he suffer the Holocaust, but when he opened this tiny little store, the only store he could afford in the worst next neighborhood of Brooklyn, the community didn't like the fact that a Jew was in there, even though he was the most ethical person in the world. He sold Ray-Ban sunglasses for $1.98 before they became frou-frou. This guy was about service, and yet in the middle of the night, the police called us three times to say that somebody had committed arson, thrown a, 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 you know, a Molotov cocktail or something like that down the chimney into my father's store and ruined it and he had to start. And he started over three times. We don't hear about those people. My father was a hero and he wasn't the only one. I think of all the Korean grocers who also had language barriers, the Chinese laundry owners, no prestige, but quietly work and succeed. 
not playing victim. I love those people. Okay. I want to turn to a, a much more pleasant topic, beauty. The silly reason why I like beauty is it doesn't take much time. I'm very time conscious. I work all the time because my definition of a life well led is using as many heartbeats as possible to make a difference. Uh, and beauty, I can look out my window and see the, the lovely mountain and trees for a moment. And I appreciate it, but I can get right back to work. I breed roses. I'm outside. I'm looking outside my room. Let me, let me turn the webcam. I guess yeah, it's a bad time of day, but uh, yeah, you can't see it. It really is a kind of a nice view, and there are roses and uh, mountains, and all you see is fog. It's crazy. But anyway, it's true. So a moment is enough for me. I also love man-made beauty. I'm admiring not just a fancy architecture, not Notre Dame Cathedral or the uh, or the Transamerica Triangle Tower. Just your average house, it's beautiful, and the architecture inside. My home is really very well architected. It's there aren't a lot of wasted space, no long hallways, a lovely living room and uh, kind of breakfast room together, which creates a nice open feel. Uh, just the right size entrance way that feels like you're in a transition between that and your house. Bedrooms are medium size, not crazy. I just love thoughtful architecture. It's beautiful and it's functional. I love it. I love art. I love Rembrandt. I have a picture. I don't know. Again, you probably can't see it. It's not even be worth my effort to try to show it to you. I'll try it, but it may not work. I'm turning it around. Uh, I have a, a, two great pictures that I love. One is Rembrandt's uh, St. Matthew inspired by the angel, even though I'm an atheist, it has nothing to do with it, but it's very, to me, inspirational. And then there's a, an, a picture of an old guy, uh, a painting of an old guy uh, walking his dog, which is, is kind of neat. Um, and I love those, but I only look at them for a moment. And I love music. I love music that people hate. I have this feeling that... People say, for example, they like jazz. But if we in, uh, uh, attach a pleasure meter to their brain in terms of whether they get more pleasure listening to a jazz solo or some, what is ridiculed, easy listening music, I would bet that the actual physiological pleasure meter would be greater than listening. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play one chorus of something that would be considered absolutely out of touch with the modern world. I'm going to play one chorus of You'll Never Walk Alone. And let's see whether you like it or you say, oh man, I wish he played hip hop or jazz. For me, that's, that would, I would predict that would score high on people's pleasure meters for what it's worth. 
Okay, even like Barry Manilow. I mean, people make fun of him. But I was listening on Alexa. I said, Alexa, play Barry Manilow. And a whole song after song after song was just beautiful and inspiring. And he's not the greatest singer in the world. He uses reverb a lot. But his orchestrations are fabulous. And the melodies and the harmonies are inspiring and beautiful. And yet, he's a source of ridicule. But I invite you, as you consider what is beautiful, is it really just beauties in the eyes of the beholder, whatever? Forgive my facetiousness. Or really, is there objective beauty that we need to probably look, sh shunt aside societal expectations and norms of coolness? And at least with something like beauty, ask yourself what really gives you pleasure. Okay, uh, since I played the piano, let me talk a little bit about piano playing. I can barely read music. I can't write notation, but I can hear. And I think some of it is my talent, definitely. I was born with it. But some of it is the crazy in my way, mind way that we teach piano. We teach piano by teaching kids to read notes. So it, the, the input goes into their eyes and it gets immediately translated to their fingers with their ears almost irrelevant. That doesn't train your ear. And playing by ear is what most people would aspire to do, to be able to at a party or for themselves, just sit down and play like I can do. I can play almost anything. If I can hum it, I can play it in full arrangement. If we taught kids to play by starting to play, okay, play Mary Had a Little Lamb with one, one finger at a time, trial and error. You'll guess wrong a lot, you'll guess right a lot, but you're getting absolute feedback moment by moment so your ear gets trained. And when you can play Mary at a Little Lamb with one finger, just the melody, try playing in the left hand a harmony note that will sound pretty. You'll guess wrong, you'll guess wrong, you'll guess wrong, you'll guess right. But eventually, and that's how I learn, and then I learn more by playing along with the record player. When I was growing up, we had a record player, a hi-fi. My idol was a guy, while everybody else was following the Beatles and, the, and the, the Stones, if they were cool, I was following Peter Nero, who is a wonderful piano. You can Google him, and he is great. If you listen to Peter, Google Peter Nero, N-E-R-O, I would play that, uh, given the first song I remember playing was something called Midnight in Moscow, and I would keep playing it again and again, and I'd keep playing along with it, wrong, 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 right, 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 every note. And that's how I got to play well. And I was playing professionally when I was 12. I played over 2,000 gigs before I was 22. That's not to brag. It's just that that's how I learned how to play the piano. My parents were really poor. We couldn't afford a piano. We had a $50 crappy upright piano. It didn't matter. Later, I got a little better piano from Macy's. <laughs> a Hardman and Peck little console. Anyway, that's my thought about piano playing. Also, you notice the one more thing about piano playing. Once you can play the notes, it is about emotion. I think the way I played You'll Never Walk Alone was not intentionally, but it, my goal unconsciously was to create feeling in people, to create variation. I went faster, slower, more intense, louder, softer. Uh, each phrase had an arc. It wasn't an intellectually thought through, but all I was thinking about, I want to play it beautifully. I want to play it filled with emotion. And I invite you who can play the notes, there's a sterility that comes from the millions of pianists who can play notes, but they don't have the magic. And the magic comes from trying to feel, build emotion. Once you can intuit the notes and play the notes, it's about emotion and not just playing statically. Okay, now I want to talk about meditation. That's so in. Notice a theme of a lot of this is, you know, what's in, what's not in. I guess let me, I should take a little break. Not for me. Uh, my announcer likes to make an announcement in the middle, let her know what you're listening to. So uh, stay with me for just a few seconds. I'm going to talk, I've got a lot of different topics to talk about. Um, I, I'll be honored if you stay with me the few seconds. Okay, thanks for staying with me. I want to talk about um, uh, Zoom versus phone versus in-person meetings. I have become, I'm a career counselor, I've had 6,000 clients, of whom I'd say, you know, I certainly I have hundreds in, on Zoom, thousands on phone, and thousands in person. And I have come to conclude that, especially in this era of strangulating traffic that we are ever more in because they want to drive us out of our cars, 
that the smartest move for most meetings is by phone. In person is a pain in the ass. You've got to sit in the car a long time or take mass transit, get sardined in. It, it's a pain. It takes a long time. Get to the get to the bar, get to the bus, have maybe a bus and a bar, then walk from there where you go, or rain and shine. It's a pain in the ass. Zoom, you've got to be smiling all the time like in person. You've got to have this good face on. I deliberately don't do that. I'm trying to be as authentic with you as I can possibly be. I'm being exactly who I am. And as I'm thinking, and my head is down, I'm sure I'm not looking in the camera like I'm supposed to. But when you're in a Zoom meeting or a Zoom call, you've got to kind of, you, it takes a certain amount of energy to keep that game face on or pleasant face or whatever. On the phone, you can be whoever you want. There's no commute. You can look the way you want. You can be in your t-shirt and shorts as I like to be. I can be uh, lying on my sofa. I can be actually looking in my garden. I can be weeding because that doesn't take any brain space and still work with my clients and be fully functional. So I think the phone is the most underrated way to interact. Now, as we're talking about this level of person, I mean, one could say, gee, you've just got Asperger's. You don't understand. I, and I don't, by the way. But, um, you know, you're just not understanding the human emotional connection that comes from in person. Yeah. There's an advantage to that, but how big is that advantage relative to the advantages, as I pointed out, of being on the phone? The next step I want to talk about that's, that goes a big step beyond that is the artificial intelligence, quote, person, robot, counselor, romantic partner, whatever. We're not there yet. I mean, I've, I, you know, not only did I watch the movie Her, but I, you know, I've, I've interacted with these, uh, quote, AI automated conversation partners or counselors, and they're still pretty lame. But it is, seems to me reasonable that especially given the progress around AI, I mean, I'm amazed that Google Translate can translate from any language to any language. And a few years ago, that would have been seen as impossible. When I make this YouTube video, it's tracking what I'm saying if I wanted to, and it will print the text underneath it, captions, which enables all of us to have multi-sensory input. They can hear me and they can see me. And if you're you know, uh, hearing impaired, you can see it. It's fantastic. Now, that kind of artificial intelligence, if you will, is amazing. And eventually, I'm guessing in five to 10 years, there will be decent, oh, it's going to be great, but it will be decent counselors, decent friends, decent romantic partners that are AI based. Is that to be sh decried? Is that to be embraced? I absolutely embrace it. It enables it, no doubt it will be less expensive for people than you know, therapists and counselors. It will be available to people in rural India, from Az people from Azerbaijan to Zambia. Anybody who's got an internet connection, if it's one thing, one technology that's ubiquitous, even in developing countries, it is cell phones. And they should be able to, from the cloud, be able to interact. And I believe that machine learning was going to enable it to get ever smarter in terms of being better at saying things that are more comprehensible or asking the right questions, etc. So that I do not fear. I also don't fear the singularity. Are, are computers going to get smarter than people? And are they going to take over the world? They'll replicate, they'll create replicas of themselves into their billions and destroy us and take over. I feel that science fiction. Anything is possible, but I think and any technology can be used for ill as well as good. But I, I think if we, if we thought that we wouldn't invent the printing press, because clearly you can write tripe or evil stuff in, uh, in print. You develop technology and then you think ethically about what kind of reasonable constraints can, can and should be placed. I'm not some libertarian who just free everything, but I'm also not a big government guy. But I think a moderate amount of regulation of something as potentially very potent as AI needs to be done. I also think that way about nuclear energy. The power is unlimited and it's getting ever safer, and it's clean. And so even lefties, environmentalists, are starting, as I have, frankly, for 20 years, been urging the development of more nuclear power with you know, a, a very appropriate uh, safety and regulation, as well as research in smarter ways for disposable, disposal of nuclear waste. I think the research in that area will do more for humankind than all the solar, because I spoke to a Nobel Prize winner and physicist at something called the Renaissance Weekend, and he said, he said that solar and wind is theater, political theater. It sounds good, 
but physics the limitations restrict how much solar and wind can solve our energy problems unless we're learning to live like back in the in the stone age where there's minimal use of electricity we want electricity in warm climates we want air conditioning we want to be able to not be a slave to our home on a bicycle no matter what the weather is and no matter what our physical condition we want to be able to drive and not just wait for the mass transit and take two buses and so nuclear energy and hydrogen energy and hydrogen cars with appropriate moderate regulation certainly deserves our research dollars more than most of the cool green initiatives that really won't solve in any significant way but are good for getting votes now I want to talk about transactionality another thing that gets a bad rep I have a dear friend who's famous who is a he's a, a well-known author and he hates the fact that most interactions with people are what he calls transactional that is they're not there just to, to get to know each other how are you doing I care about your family how are you they're there to accomplish something to make a deal of some sort deal you know in a small d some kind of an agreement or come up with a solution to a problem or whatever I love that because my definition of the meaning of life is as I said using every heartbeat as po as many heartbeats as possible to improve your sphere of influence and if I'm talk and I have about five of these people that I talk with for a half hour every two weeks and during usually roughly the first 15 minutes I help them solve a problem second 15 minutes to help me solve a problem or we agree to do something together but it isn't just chatting about family pop culture travel what we watched on TV no I love transactionality I like good trans I'm not saying transactionality to figure out how to destroy the human race but transactionality f to increase net humankind happiness bingo love it now a word about saying hi to passers-by when I was in New York nobody would ever say hello to somebody who was a stranger and I was listening to this uh, um, this uh, book audio book by a woman named Tisby Nisa Tisby or something about Israel and she laughs she's from Israel and but she, and she lives in Hollywood now but she laughs in Hollywood how everybody just says hi to strangers it seems so so superfluous it seems almost paternalistic and I can understand that from where I come from New York and yet I, I think there is another side it's acknowledging another person it's saying I'm not scared of you I don't dislike you you're a human being and it cost you nothing so I have mixed feelings about it it depends on my mood sometimes I'll just keep my head down I'm in thought whatever and sometimes I especially if the person somehow looks nice I don't know I'll say hi or I'll nod my head I don't know so I think there's two sides to the saying hi to passers-by thing even if it's hi how are you fine how are you and then you keep walking it's, it's it's silly it's puerile but I think there's two sides to it it could be puerile on one hand on the other hand it just acknowledges the humanity of another person and in this age I think more than ever where there's so much everybody seems on a hair trigger providing just a bit of humanity to each other is a good thing now some thoughts about interrupting another axiom is it's wrong to interrupt I don't agree with that I think it's much more nuanced than that all things being equal I want to default to not interrupting a person when they're talking it's a sign of respect very often toward the end of what they're saying they end up saying some their best idea because in talking it out they get clearer about what's right but I will interrupt when I feel I'm bored I when I really know what they're about to say when I have something important to say and it's going to vary on, on with the person certain cultures like the one I come from this kind of New York Jewish culture interrupting is normative you watch any word out I think about a Woody Allen movie where the family was having Thanksgiving dinner and they're all interrupting each other all the time. it's just normative it's not an insult in any way but in some other cultures that I recall and like in a Norwegian culture up in Minnesota in Minnesota nice at a church dinner interrupting would be seen as rude and not loving and not kind and all the rest of it so I take that into account in terms of who I'm talking with so I think that's one size and it was Lee Steinberg the famous um, uh, sports agent who said never interrupt it's the worst thing you can ever do um, I don't buy that I think it's more nuanced I think you have to think about the net impact of interrupting on that person and on yourself okay next 
I want to say something about outsiders. I definitely consider myself an outsider. I am a political moderate. I hold some conservative views and some liberal views, in a, in a, in, at least in my world in the San Francisco Bay Area and on the two coasts, where unless you're a lefty, pretty much a lefty, you're an outsider. And I do feel like an outsider because I'm not across the board lefty. I am not. I have very mixed feelings about capitalism versus socialism. I am very unquestionably pro-choice and pro-gay marriage, 100%. I'm anti-materialism. That's nice and lefty. But I, in my PhD is in the evaluation of innovation. And so I know a lot about education and attempts to improve it and attempts to improve the lives of people uh, and close the achievement gap. And I am, I've become conservative about that because the program simply notwithstanding what the politicians and the advocates say, they don't generally work. They don't really close the achievement gap. And the taxpayers' dollars count. Those are human beings who worked hard for their money and are really pissing away money on these social programs that sound good, that are virtue signaling, but don't close the achievement gap. So I'm clearly an outsider. I've got very liberal views. I've got some conservative views. And it's hard. I'm not a, a very social person, so it's not like I'm really lonely a lot. But it does feel yucky to be an outsider, to not f have many kindred spirits. When I watch CNN, they aren't my kindred spirits. When I watch Fox, occasionally they are, but often they're not. When I, my friends, are all, everybody's all liberal, and I feel like I have to shut up or be argumentative, and I, I'm not good in arguing. I'm very solid and rigorous, but I end up making people feel defensive, and they, they don't like me because of my intensity. I, I do argue quite rigorously, but it's not enough. It's, I don't, once I get into an argument, I, I lose, I make a choice to focus on the truth, even at the risk of hurting people's feelings, or what I believe is the truth. And when I think their ideas are stupid, I don't label them as such, but my body language or my voice or my counter makes them feel like I think they're stupid. Uh, so I'm an outsider, and it feels yucky. We all would like, and I'm an atheist, so you know, it's not like I'm going to join a synagogue or a church. It's not who I am. I'm not a joiner. I don't like taking classes. I'm bored in most classes, to tell you the truth. I hate the pace of classes. Not just because it's too slow, but sometimes because it's stuff I don't give a shit about. So I'm here by myself. I love, so I listen to audio books. I read books. I uh, listen to podcasts. I listen to... Uh, Lex Friedman, I listen to Dershowitz, I, uh, I like Tyler Cowen. But I'm, that, I'm alone most of the time. Play the piano, make these YouTubes for you, write articles, write books. I don't see my clients, but they're, I have a measure of control there too. And I love look, I look forward to every client because I'm so alone all the time. I don't know, do you feel like you're an outsider sometimes? Anyway, I just thought I'd share what it feels like to be an outsider at least one out there. I'm an anomalous kind of outsider, I would think. It's not like I'm, you know, I remember that movie, The Outsiders, where there was teenagers wearing black leather jackets and, and the cigarette under their under their ear and their, the slick back hair. What hair? Um, I'm not that kind of outsider. But I thought it'd be interesting, for me at least, to share with you my honest self-appraisal about my outsiderhood and how it makes me feel. I talked about evaluation. My PhD is actually, as I said, in the evaluation of innovation. I really think there's a need to evaluate the evaluators. So often, if I go into evaluate a program, which I don't do anymore, but I did when I was younger. Now I'm a career and personal coach full time. But I would go into a program and I knew they hated me, not me as a person, but who wants to be evaluated? Because they already got funded for a program in some kind of a college preparatory program. I did one for Berkeley. Um, and they were glad they got their money. All I could do is make their life worse. If I say their program is okay, maybe they'll continue to get funding. If I say their program sucks, they could lose their funding. So why would they want to be candid with me? They don't. They smile. They make themselves seem like they're sharing candidly with me, but they often don't. How useful is evaluation? How can we get the evaluated entity to be more candid? Is it a matter of educating them to realize that humankind will benefit? Or two people who are more caring about number one. They want, to, they want to keep their job as program director. I don't think we've done enough research on how to ensure evaluation results are implemented. I know, for example, fat tomes don't work. Shorter is better. A lot of smart people want to cover their ass 
with their insecurity by writing a fat tome about whether it be an evaluation report or it be a book or whatever. But real change doesn't occur, I believe, in long form. It's more CYA, more cover your ass, whether it be an evaluation report or whatever. I've written books as long as 774 pages, a reference book called How to Get an Ivy League Education at State University, where I profiled 150 colleges. But the older I get, the more I venerate the short form. And I mean, this is considered long form, but I'm talking, I'll be talking roughly 40, another 10 minutes, 45 minutes, but I will have covered 15 topics with my very best thoughts. After that, I believe I'm reaching an asymptote, a point of diminishing returns. So you're getting kind of the best of Marty Nemco's ideas on a million topics, which hopefully is interesting. It's brief. I like short form. I like tweets. My latest book is called Soloists. It's 123 short, short stories that each take two minutes to read about a character who's an introvert or an outsider facing a dilemma. I like short form. I like tweets. I've written over 2,000 tweets because I believe that you can share your best ideas very concisely if, you, if you're disciplined. Okay, now I want to talk about research. Too much research to me is biased. Either in the favor of a person's ideological bias, or they just want to get a positive result so they can get it published and get tenure or whatever. There's a lot of crappy research and f research that gets funded on the issues that are cool for the day. I'm specifically not, I'm, there are specifics I imagine you can think of them too, but I'm deliberately not going to mention them. Some things are not, something I deeply believe, for example, is that intelligence, the ability to reason well, is the most important variable of all, and yet it is politically out of favor to talk about intelligence, because we're all supposed to be equal. But really, the ability to solve problems, whether it be at the low end, just day-to-day -day family problems, or at the high end, curing, curing COVID, or developing a better artificial intelligence counselor or cure for cancer, that's all about intelligence. And it's well acknowledged that intelligence is, let's just say, part, certainly a significantly part is genetic and a significant part is environment. We've tried, we've spent literally trillions of dollars over 50 years to try to improve the environmental side and the achievement gap is as wide as ever. I believe that research on unpopular but critical topics like intelligence, and it's extraordinarily complex. I was listening to my uh, a podcast on Lex Friedman, this guy, Richard Heyer, he was talking about how complex really understanding intelligence is. It w requires starting to understand the genes as a, which gene combination of genes could be a thousand genes get expressed, creating what neurotransmitters, what pre neurotransmitters, what axons, what, what dendrites, what circuits, very complicated. But then again, I do have this almost religious belief that we have to have at least some people doing this basic research, not translated into, into a pill tomorrow, but even if it's not 10 or 20 years until it really has human applications to improve humankind, I think the most honorable stuff we could fund is research that 20 years down the road will have a major effect on humankind, unarguably, for example, cancer, curing or preventing cancer, and more controversial, at least ensuring, you know, right now, 16% of the population has an IQ under 85. That makes it almost impossible for them to function very well on their own. Imagine there was metaphorically an intelligence pill that could eliminate that and on the high end, enable people to, I mean, high end intelligence, keeping more ideas in your head and manipulating them at one time in clever and interesting ways. That is going to be key to wise leaders, better bridge builders, better iPhone developers, better AI counselors, better vaccines. I really believe that there is an area of research that is underfunded. While we're still busy funding yet more social science research that is so subject to investigator bias. Now I want to talk about utility. Let me take another another break. Um, I do that about every 20 minutes or so. Anyway, um, I'm, if you'll stay with me just a few seconds, the announcer will say your thing, and then I will uh, talk for just a, for maybe another 10 minutes about utilitarianism, which sounds complicated, but it's really important and true. 
on the importance of merit, stock investing, ETFs and mutual funds, and intergalactic research. So there we go for eclecticism. I hope you stay with me. Thank you for staying with me. I want to talk about utilitarianism. Sounds like a, a fancy word, a pompous word. What it really means is making decisions. This is a lefty thing. It's a utilitarian, it's a socialist, communist thing. Making decisions based on what's going to do the most good for the most people. I am a pure libertarian, or at least I aspire to be. I try. I try to make as many decisions not based on what's good for a subset of the population, a group. I'm, talk, I'm talking about making policy recommendations, or even for myself. I try to think about what's going to make the biggest difference to the most people. And so, for example, one of the times just popped into my head, I'll talk about ability group classes. We used to, it seems to me, follow the unquestionable common sense of grouping students by ability. I like to use the example, if you were trying to learn Mandarin, and there were two choices of classes, one where they mixed beginners and advanced students together in the same class, and the other where they had just beginners. Wouldn't you learn more in the class of just beginners if you were a beginner? Because then a larger percentage of instructional time will be on your level. If it's if got high achievers and low achievers, advanced native speakers of, of Mandarin, a much lower percentage. Sure, you're going to learn something from the modeling, but not enough. In today's classes, we have developmentally disabled, violent kids, average kids, native-born speakers of English, newcomers, gifted kids, all in the same class. So the amount of on, on appropriately leveled instruction is far less, all in the name of this political correctness, egalitarianism thing, or that hopefully what the bright the bright what the bright kids do will rub off on the on the slower kids, and a little of that may occur. But more often, what it's going to do is remind those slower kids of their that how diff how big the gap is between them and the bright kids. A bridge very difficult to cross. So ut utilitarianist thinking would say you've got to have ability group classes. Net, it's going to benefit the most people. Of course, are there going to be occasional misplaced people? This kid who's priced in the dumb class who should have been in the genius class? Of course it happens. But when you make public policy, you've got to make policy for everybody. Like the, the policy says stop at a red light. There's going to be times when it doesn't matter to stop at a red light. You can run it in the safe. But we recognize that laws have to be made that are going to have, be in the net common interest. And it's the same true of many more policies that are less black and white, red and white, than traffic lights. Whether it be how to spend the money. I like to use the metaphor of the solar farm. If it was your money, your solar farm, and you had solar farm, a solar farm, 10 solar farms in different locations, and you tracked which produced the most solar energy, and which to lose the least. And you had additional money you wanted to invest in your in those some of those solar farms. Only a fool would invest it in the solar farms that had been least productive. It's going to produce the least solar energy. You're going to invest in those that are, if not the most, would seem to, with some some moderate effort, going to be able to be very productive. And yet we do the opposite in education today. Vastly disproportionate amounts of the money, despite what the media says, is spent on the lowest achievers in compensatory education, especially at the federal level. That's not utilitarian. That's not in the interest of best kids. There's plenty of gifted kids who sit stultified. Fourth graders who can read on a sixth grade level teaching slow kids cat in the hat, the ultimate redistribution, indentured servitude. That's not utilitarian. It's not in the interest of the larger society. We want bright and slow kids to have maximum instruction on their own level so they can all live up to their potential. That's utilitarianism, and it's the opposite of where we are today. A related concept is merit. Something I deeply believe in is that merit must be the criterion for almost all selection, whether it be admission to college, hiring, promotion, how we allocate money. Demographics is taking over too large a component of decision making, and merit therefore is, is a smaller piece of the decision making criterion. From a utilitarian perspective, it's very easy to talk about unlevel playing fields and legacy of slavery and and systemic racism and and etc. And to the extent that well, believe to another day the extent to which those are in major factors in the achievement gap and not. But ultimately, it, I am confident that we do the most good 
by investing our money, our human resources, our slots in colleges, medical schools, based on who is going to make, the, who is most, there's no guarantees, but who is most likely to make this, their sphere of influence or the world better. If I am an AI researcher, I'm going to turn, you know, to let's say I want to turn to AI searching for in, in, intelligence on other planets, extraterrestrial intelligence. If the only thing I consider is who, I don't care if they're black or white or, or a woman or a man or anywhere on the gender matrix, if they have the best combination of intelligence, skills, and drive, independent of their, their demographics, we will be more likely to find that intelligent life, hopefully more intelligent than we are, than if I let any other factors. And that's true of whether I'm doing AI to create better counselors, AI-assisted education, AI-assisted doctors, AI-assisted entertainment to help us better select stories or music that we would like better. Merit is much more central than we today give it credit for. I'm going to talk a little bit about stock investing. It's almost a dirty word. We're in almost a post-capitalist society, at least on the two coasts here. And again, maybe I'm being over-affected by the Bay Area. But how wonderful it seems to me that a child can own a share of Disney stock or Amazon stock or Meta stock or whatever for a few dollars at almost no commission. And thereby, instead of having the money sit as inflation goes up, money losing value, you are essentially having the smartest people in the world, that is the employees of a Google or an Amazon or a Disney, working their butts off to make money, yes, to make money. And therefore, if they do make money, if more people go to the better, ever better Disney world or watch better Pixar movies, which is owned by Disney, I think still, you, the kid, is gonna make money. And as you, if you're more disciplined as an adult, I was read recently that if you put, at age 30, if you put 100 bucks a month into a plain vanilla Standard & Poor's 500 ETF, that's basically a market basket of the 500 largest companies in America, you would, at a historical average rate of return, which I think is 9.9%, if you put in $100 a month at age 30, at age 55, that Hundred dollars a month be worth one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. That's fantastic. You're getting the, you know, whatever the limitations. We all have limitations, whether it be companies or individuals. But you're getting the best and brightest of the people working for you without you having to lift you on the on, the, on your back. As long as you have the discipline of systematic investing, not trying to time the market, just putting in that hundred every month, the miracle of compounding, is going to make you a remarkable amount of money. I think that's one of the best things in America. And finally, just a couple of words. Uh, no, you know what? I've already talked a little bit about intergalactic research. I'm not sure. I think I have reached my asymptote about what I have to say about that. No, I guess I'll say something. I don't think it's good. It's, it's cool, but I don't think it's worth it. Sure, we could come up with some amazing things, whether it be other planets we could live on Mars, or that, in fact, there is intelligence 19 galaxies from us that are, you know... But there are so much better uses of the money from a utilitarian perspective. We're more likely to make a difference to humankind if we put that money into AI research to cure cancer or increase intelligence or to prevent depression or to do a better job of doing simply research analysis on what products people want to buy than if we're spending on some space probe to Venus or Mars or whatever. One guy's opinion. Anyway, that was my attempt at doing uh, something, uh, a podcast called In My Humble Opinion. Talked about diet, uh, and it's, I believe it's, it's the importance of moderation and um, not getting crazy in any directions around it. Some uh, thoughts about careers and which are worthy and not. Some examples, a little making fun of materialism. Uh, the argument for and against caring much about clothes, 
uh, the importance of beauty, and is it really only in the eye of the beholder? And if it's momentary, you can appreciate beauty even moment to moment if you're a work like a holic like me. And uh, I tried to demonstrate beauty in playing the, in music by playing the piano and asking you to contrast the actual pleasure you got in listening to me play You'll Never Walk Alone versus some of the more cool kind of music. Uh, a little bit about the art of playing the piano that's crucial to teach by ear with trial and error rather than reading your notes, which actually atrophies your ears. I didn't say much about meditation. I, I'll say a little bit about it. I feel like um, I tried meditation. Uh, and it, it's a manifestation of the current veneration of things Eastern and antipathy to things Western. The temptation of wanting to be still and relax and just be. But I really think if the purpose, the real purpose of meditation should be to increase focus. I believe the world would focus better and more thoughtfully. If instead of those 20 minutes twice a day that you're meditating, you spend 20 days, 20 minutes a day, twice a day or once a day, thinking hard about the problem you are currently facing, and maybe journaling about it. I think meditation is another fad. It's going to go away. Um, I made an argument in favor of phone being the smartest way to have meetings rather than Zoom, where you've got to be keep that pleasant game on face in person, which because of the, the traffic that by design government wants us to be in, and mass transit, which takes even longer, is a pain. But by phone, I love it. And eventually, I think there will be AI people who are not just for customer service, but as counselors, maybe teachers, that may be better than, uh, we, or at least affordable options for folks. I talked about how transactional interactions are often criticized unfairly. I think pro-social interactions, I have these, like I said, every two weeks, I meet with pairs of five people. Uh, and first 15 minutes, they share a problem, and I try to help them solve it. On the second 15, I try to, uh, I share a problem, they try to solve it. And, and or we try to team up on some kind of pro-social thing. I think that's purely transactional. It's not asking about your family or pop culture or travel or whatever. I think transactionality has gotten a bad name. Um, I gave the pros and cons of saying hi to passersby strangers. I, I like to think I gave a more nuanced view of that no interrupting is too black and white. There are times to interrupt and, uh, in light of your needs and the person's. Um, the difficulty of being an outsider in today's world where you are in a bubble of one sort or another, even the bubbles that tend to be on the coast tend to be leftist bubbles. Perhaps in some parts of the center of the country, they tend to be more conservative bubbles. Uh, it's difficult, even if you're a kind of a loner like me. Uh, the importance of uh, evaluation, but that it gets stonewalled by organizations that get evaluated. We need to do research on how to get programs that are to be evaluated, to be more open to your input. Um, my core belief is utilitarianism. I try to make as many decisions and policy beliefs as possible based on what is going to be do the most good for the most people. It sounds communist and it probably is, but I think that is ultimately a wise criterion for which you should make all decisions. And a subset of that is that merit trumps all. There are benefits to considering demographics, but net-net, from a utilitarian perspective, making merit the criterion uh, is probably the wisest thing for humankind. I praised stock investing, uh, especially ETFs, that uh, where you get a market basket of stock and diversification and some tax advantages. And anybody rich and poor, including children, can invest. And through the miracles of compounding, if you consistently invest every month a little bit, it's amazing how much money you can make. And then finally, I said, I think that all this focus on space research is uh, not the wisest use of money from a utilitarian perspective. There are better uses, more likely benefits to derive by s addressing problems on Earth, like safer nuclear energy and safer nuclear energy disposal and artificial intelligence for pro-social ends. Of course, all technologies can be used for evil. And therefore, there's a need for moderate regulation. 
but I think the, the focus on those core problems on Earth that have tremendous potential to humankind should proceed with abandon. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. <clears throat> I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel if you're watching this on YouTube or my podcast, which is this is going to be an episode of the podcast, my podcast called How to Do Life, which you which you can find on, on uh, Spotify or on uh, Amazon uh, Audible or on uh, uh, Apple iTunes. Uh, and I do like to end in, uh, every podcast with my very favorite quote, which I do believe is more important now than ever in my lifetime. And that was written by a guy named Frank A. Clark. And it is, we find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't.